um, let's see, I'm going to pick one of these. I'm going to start something here. After the chastening of his baby brother in church, Jason sobbed all, sobbed all the way home in the back seat of the car. His father asked him three times what was wrong. Finally, the boy replied through tears. That preacher said, he made you promise to bring us up in a Christian home, and I wanted to stay with you guys. <laughs> <laughs> the home's where we work it out, right? <laughs> um, just last week, I, I was given the gift of going to a pastor's retreat, you know, a, re a rest, refill, be inspired, and it was an extravagant gift. It was a great time. Um, my biggest takeaway, and by the way, thank you for letting me get away and do that, so important. Um, the biggest takeaway from me was like in the first five minutes, like the first introduction of the first session you guys hear me talk all the time about presence because you know me well enough to know that um i i get that that's all there is that that's all that this is about it's not religion it's about the presence of god so we're always praying you know lord let your sweet his presence is here no matter what right but we pray make us aware let your sweet presence be be so available to us that it's undeniable, and we're touched by you, and we're blessed, right? Well, this is what happens in the first five minutes. Um, this first speaker stands up and starts to say, um, I just want to start by asking God um, why he brought you here. Why, why are you here? Of course, you've got a room full of pastors. And I, <laughs> I usually hate going to things where they're going to gather a whole bunch of pastors in one room. Usually you talk about a bunch of people who, conceal, who can conceal and be completely unavailable. It's like, it's like a room full of pastors, right? Um, but <laughs> this was different. These were wonderful people. It must be what the Renovari people attract because it was transparent and it was lovely. And so, but a room full of pastors, so we all get real serious. There's only two options here, right? Either the Lord really brought me here for great purpose. I'm to bless one of the participants here. He's got some things for me to do, right? That's one option. Um, and I'm forgetting, what is the other option? There's only two options. Um, the other is the Lord really wants to bless me and I need to be here to, to refill, you know, my soul's in deep trouble. And so we were thinking on these deep levels. And then, and then here comes the mind blower. The speaker, she says, um, what if it's just, she said, we're always praying, Lord, may we have your presence. And she said, what if you're here because he delights in your presence? That he thought this wouldn't even be, this would be no party at all if your presence wasn't here. And I'm going, you see, see these, me and these other pastors were sitting back in our chairs going, well, I was way off track. <laughs> but isn't that delightful? I think that that's true about you guys. I think the Lord, um, why, why are you here? Why are you in this community, in your family, in your ministry, whatever it is? Might it be that he just he delights in you so much that it wouldn't just it just wouldn't be the same for him if it wasn't for your presence. Boy, that throws things upside down, doesn't it? But it sounds more right, doesn't it? Um, he always shows up. The question is, did did we? <laughs> Amen. So um, I think for the month of May, um, I feel like that this month should be a party. Um, I, I really do. <laughs> the weather's changing. This is the season like when, when you're back in a school program. I'm thinking back to earlier days. This is when you start playing hooky, you know, because the weather's so nice. How could I possibly go to class? I'm going to take an extra long lunch. How could I possibly return to work with the weather being this nice? And could it be that that's the image of God in you? Playing hooky? Like it sounds like a bad behavior. But um, God has some bad behavior, doesn't he? And I think this month we're going to look at what we're invited into. Um, that's my plan. And I just want to start by going, how do you imagine God's personality? As I start to introduce this series. You guys hear me say it all the time. Um, what, what does the word of God say? Um, make no graven image of me. 
In other words, do not, God says, do not make a dead image of me. <laughs> that would be so unfitting, right? Um, and so you hear me say all the time, um, the image we have of God affects everything, doesn't it? It affects the way we pray, the image of him that you hold. It affects the way you approach scripture, the image of him that you hold. How you interpret what you read in the pages of your Bible. How you invite the Holy Spirit to, to open your eyes to something new in his word all begins with how you, um, how you see him, doesn't it? What is his personality like? And so I sort of want to start this, this series. I, this series is going to be the playfulness of God. Um, and I just want to ask you straight, simply and straight up, does your understanding of God's personality include playfulness? Is he playful? I got some really strong yeses. Does he play with you? <laughs> Me too. Me too. How often do you think he's trying to play with you and you're missing it? Because I don't know. My personality, I was accused of being far too serious when I was like eight years old. I was already too serious. And so how, how much of the time do I miss the playfulness of God when he's, when he's actually trying to play with me? Do you think you do that sometimes? <clears throat> And, and I think what's going on in the world, is, is anybody feeling, at least in part of your life, if not the whole darn thing, you're feeling kind of tired, kind of worn out by the, the current events of our day or the current events of your day, of your family, or whatever it is you're facing? It can get kind of tiring, isn't it? And you almost start to look around going, God, where are you in this? Just me? No, you too? Okay. <clears throat> and so you got to permit me to ramble around. You know how I am at the start of a series. Um, the very first verse of the Bible has, has the Spirit of God hovering over the face of the waters, getting ready to create. Now, how do you think that he was at that moment? Do you think he was, he's about to do a pretty big thing. I'm just saying. Do you think that he was nervous? <laughs> Excited? Yeah. Do you think he felt playful? Yes. Now, now, here's the real question. Do you think he approached it like an engineer? Or do you think he was more like an artist, almost wondering what's going to happen? Like, how is this going to work out? Not that he was going to get something wrong. I mean, could he possibly? He is God, but I think he was probably more like an artist getting ready to paint. Don't you? With that, that kind of that feeling in your, in your stomach, like, this is going to be neat. <clears throat> now, here's another one for you. If you were the God of the universe, the creator of all things, and you were getting ready to initiate a relationship or, or establish um, a community of people, for yourself, a chosen people who were going to party with you all the way through. I guess I let the cat out of the bag. Um, who were going to be your people, your friends, your ministers in this thing. Um, what's the first thing you would do? Or what would you make the foundation or the staple of the laws that you would set forth for those people? <laughs> And um, do you know what it is? Like, if you look really closely, he established a regular cadence of parties. Did he not? That's the whole law. <laughs> I know there were instructions that don't get me wrong. There are serious stuff. You know, um, make no graven image of me. That's pretty serious. There, there's lots of stuff in the law, but really, if you look at the foundation of the law, he said, my people shall set on their calendars and shall observe a regular established calendar for partying. 
That's what he thought he'd do. I mean, some of it was like camping and stuff. You think about the, the Feast of Booths or Tabernacles. One of the things that his law says is, once a year, my, de- my chosen people that I delight in, you shall go camping. <laughs> you shall erect your tents and kind of like um, Elder Paul does on the, the men's fishing retreat coming up in June, you'll set up a kitchen because there's going to be feasting at my campsites. And uh, they, would, they would have to set all these things up and do it together as a community. What, what a party. Not unlike the way we do it as the season starts to change here, huh? Eight days. Yeah, this wasn't like, this was not a long weekend. <laughs> Everything must stop. Every business shall close. Let the party commence. (laughs) Is God playful? I think so. And if um, if you were a crazy enough God that you were gonna you were gonna take on flesh and become a man, because you know the the foundation of God is that um, He made you to relate with Him. We always think the opposite. We always think, oh, it's hard to relate with God. Um, you know, he's, he's silent with me in my prayer. And it, it's, you, you really have to um, make it through seminary and study all the right things in order to have a relationship with God, to relate with him, really. And the truth is that's exactly the opposite of the truth. Uh, essentially, you have to heal from seminary and get back to, which we're going to talk about today, to the childlikeness <laughs> where you can actually relate with a crazy, playful God, God like ours. Amen? So if that God was going to become a man because he just wants to be that relatable, he delights in us and wants to be with us that bad, and he was going, just hypothetically, if he was going to initiate a ministry with, with, um, with 12 intimately close friends or buds that were going to do this ministry with him, what would be his first great act of stepping out and doing something? Make wine. (laughs) And just let me remind you, um, anytime you're establishing a new ministry, I mean, everybody knows this, the first things that you do are going to establish a culture. It's going to establish a flavor, um, a a type of a way that we relate, a way that we are together that's going to flavor everything else, all the serious things we do. It's all going to start with the first things. And the first thing he did was take his boys to a wedding and make sure the party didn't run out of alcohol. (laughs) Now, if that feels irreverent to someone, I, I understand. I'd like to say I'm sorry, but I'm not. Um, I just think it's really accurate about, about who he is and how he would start things, isn't it? I don't want to minimize ser- serious things happened there. Do you know that, um, most of you probably know this, that he was saving the family if they had run out of the wine, that would have been deeply shameful for the family. I mean, you just don't do that in their culture. And so he saved the party for the bride and groom. He saved shame on the parents that were throwing the wedding party and all of that. Serious things happened. Faith was built. But now, let me give you another one. You you all know the story. You know what Jesus said. At some point, Jesus says, you you know how it goes. His mom comes to him and says, and says, Jesus, um, we, we need to save these people. They're about to run out of wine. And, and he's going, no, Mom, no. And she's going, do whatever he says. He's going to help you out. And she walks away. There's humor right there, okay? Um, I don't know what your moms are like, but it's, it's not that far off from the way it was in my house growing up. But here's the thing. We also read that Jesus' reaction was like, it's not my time. Isn't that what he says? In other words, what's he mean? He knows that if he does this, there is a consequence. And the consequence is, is that his ministry is going to launch. Now, I want to ask you, did, have any of you ever had God lead you into something? And it's not that you're not cool with it. I mean, I, I, most of the time, I'm not even cool with it at first. My answer is no, God. Um, but it's not that you're not cool with it. Um, you're going to go, you'll go with him, but you're kind of thinking, I really need to prepare for this. Like the timing needs, I need to really, especially the way I, my particular 
wound set makes it so Sandra makes fun of me all the time. It's she says she does this with me. She goes aim, aim, <laughs> aim, aim, and I'm like okay, like you know, like you never fire off the arrow. I'm still preparing. I'm still aiming. Or I'll be shamed and I'll die. That's what my wounds would scream at me, right? And I don't think Jesus was feeling quite, quite like that. Um, but I do feel like he was thinking, no, it's not time yet. In fact, he said it. I'm not quite prepared for this. And he knew that that would be the consequence. You follow? And yet, um, I'm just going to propose, I'm probably going to propose several things where you're going to have to make up your mind this morning if you agree with me or not. But I think there was a moment there where Jesus had to choose playfulness <laughs> over his, even maybe his preference or, or how he might like it to go. He chose to to choose, he chose playfulness, which required a heck of a lot of trust in his father. Do you know that playfulness is, um, might be one of the riskiest things that you do oftentimes? You know, research shows that um, there are requirements for play. Um, really research on children, although I'm going to say it applies to adults because I can relate with it and I am one, so I know that, or sometimes I am one, and I know that, but playfulness, one of the requirements for playfulness is that you feel safe. Research shows you won't play if you don't feel safe. And I'm going to propose before we're done this morning that it is trust in the Father. It is the safety of knowing that you are the Son of God that is the great invitation to play. We all get to play. It requires the healing of knowing I have a trustworthy Father who invites me to play and, uh, and so therefore I'm safe enough to accept the invitation. this right now <clears throat> you know play and I'm, I'm about to jump into some scripture I promise I will but do you know play also um, what did I just see or think of it it has everything to do with the present moment you know most of the serious stuff we do we're we're in um, regret or, or we're thinking about the past right um, and we might be doing something in the present. We're kind of partially available <laughs> for the present moment in most serious things. And we're also worried about the future, right? We're worried about how this is going to go, what's going to happen. We're, we're running what-if scenarios in our head. But do you know that play is absent of worry about the future, and it's absent of regret about the past. Play... And I'm going to suggest in the playfulness of God, play is something that is completely about the present moment. And this whole month in this series, I'm going to be suggesting that if there is anyone who modeled for us playfulness, it was Jesus and he lived in the present moment. There's nothing that'll kill the present moment more than worry about the future. Does anybody know that? <laughs> Someday I'm going to be free of that. <laughs> anybody else? I am, I am classically good at worry. I'm getting far better as the years go on. I'm getting more and more of a don't give a darn about the future. I'm going to live this moment just a little bit more every year in my life. That's healing. <laughs> anybody else need that same healing? Yeah, I'm going to suggest, I'm going to show you in the Word of God, I think, that, um, now get ready for this, playfulness is one of the most powerful things God holds for our freedom and transformation. Could it be that he just delights to play with you? And that perhaps... This is an entire story of playing with those he delights in. Is that normally how you, how you think of him? His personality? I want you to go to uh, Mark 10 with me. I'm going to start in verse 13. Verse 13. 
generally speaking, who plays better than anybody else? Kids. <laughs> yeah. yeah, children play. I've noticed my son, he'll turn anything into play. I mean, even when we have a work day and we'll be kind of like, say, we're, we're cleaning up the yard and, uh, you know, getting ready for summer and that kind of thing. And, and I'll be like, well, we need to get some fresh wood over by the fire pit. We're going to have some great days this summer at the fire pit. And I'll tell him, can you, can you haul some of the wood over here so it's right here by the pit? Sure. The next thing I know, he's, he's got the four-wheeler. He's hooking up a trailer for like 10 sticks of wood. And I'm sitting there going, oh, thank you for your help. That's going to take like 45 minutes longer than it needed to take. But you see, for him, it wasn't work to begin with. He was playing all along. He wasn't coming up with the most efficient manner of doing things. He was coming up with the most adventurous, wildly fun way to get this done. And I'm the adult over there going, ah, oh, son, <laughs> like, do we have to do it that way? Children, children just play, don't they? Here in uh, Mark 10, 13, uh, reads like this. Then they brought little children to him that he might touch them. But the disciples rebuked those who brought them. But when Jesus saw it, he was greatly displeased. He was greatly displeased over that. And said to them, let the little children come to me and do not forbid them, for of such is the kingdom of God. Assuredly, I say to you, whoever does not receive the kingdom of God as a little child will by no means enter it. And he took them up in his arms, the kids, that is, and laid his hands on them and blessed them. That's a pretty serious thing Jesus just said. I know you've heard it before, but try to hear it for the first time. Whoever does not receive the kingdom of God as a little child will by no means enter it. That makes me think it's pretty important that we understand how a little child receives things. In fact, let's, let, let's throw some things out. How, how do children receive things? How do children go about their world? Hit me with some. Innocence, okay? They're not feeling, they're not all riddled about the past, feeling guilty about the last moment, are they? And what did you say? It's free. free. They're just free. Unabashed. Unabashed, okay. Say again. Joyful. Uninhibited. Uninhibited. <laughs> say, I. They squeal with delight. Everything's delightful. They live with an automatic wonder, don't they? I mean, things that have become far too ordinary for us are wonderful to them. <laughs> there's imagination, isn't there? I don't think I can do anything with my son where there's not an active imagination. Um, he's got a steady stream of good ideas, always. I don't know where he gets it from. <laughs> uh, <but laughs> Now, of course I do. It's kind of like me, but he, it's way more alive in him, I'll tell you. I'm trying to reawaken mine. Everything's wonderful. Do you know risk is fun when you're a kid? You know, a big element of play, um, and th this is actually in the research too, is that play involves risk. Play is not boring. I think it's the reason the emergency rooms stay filled with kids sometimes. How do they play? They're like, set up an obstacle course and we need to jump from here to there. And if it was too easy, what do you do? You reset the course. It has to be higher and further apart. That wasn't risky at all until somebody's in an ambulance. and <laughs> That's a child's version of play. Risk is an essential part of play. Dirt, yeah, messiness and mud is essential to good play. <laughs> okay, I want to read Mark nine thirty three. So we're in this. Um, so we backed up. Actually, is what we've done a chapter before. That's another place Jesus talks about the kids, and it says, "Then he came to Capernaum, and when he was in the house, he asked them." What was it you disputed among yourselves on the road? How many of you already know what it is? Who's the greatest? <laughs> but they kept silent. I bet they did. <laughs> For on the road they had disputed among themselves who would be the greatest. 
And he sat down, called the twelve, and said to them, If anyone desires to be first, he shall be last of all and servant of all. Then he took a little child and set him in the midst of them. And when he had taken him in his arms, he said to them, Whoever receives one of these little children in my name receives me. And whoever receives me receives not me, but him who sent me. Now, I don't know if you've ever thought about I never thought about it quite like I did in preparing for this message, so maybe it's true for you too. Do you think about um, what it is to receive a child? Is it easier to receive a child or receive an adult? Now, that answer may vary for different people in the room, but I'm going to suggest it's more difficult to receive a child. You see, um, religious things like Bible study and, um, oh, just gaining in knowledge and things like that can prepare us to receive adults, can't it? But um, there's no faking it with a child. Do you know um, what makes a child um, drawn to you or where, where a child is willing to be, to be received by you? It's just, it's just the genuineness of, I see you, I delight in you, I'm interested in you. And I'm going to suggest that is way harder than a lot of the preparation for getting ready to receive adults. They won't be faked out. If you're not genuinely interested and delighted in them, they will know it no matter how you try to <laughs> try to deceive them into thinking you're interested in them. And this says, um, whoever receives one of these little ones receives me. And not just me, but the one who sent me is done in the way of receiving a child. In other words, someone who's really ready to play <laughs> is someone that, that the courts of heaven, that, that the Father can just so quickly receive. Someone who's got a party ready to burst out of their heart. Someone who's looking for the fun in all of it. I, I think that's what it says. Do you agree? One of the other things they said at the retreat, and I'm going to jump into another scripture here, but um, one of the things they, they started out with at one of the sessions was, um, do you know that the kingdom of God is not in danger? <laughs> this one wasn't received so well. I'm looking around the room like, how are these guys going to react to this? Like, it was so entertaining to me. Some, some people sat back in their chair like, there's a war going on. Like you can almost read their minds, right? You can almost see their brains smoking like there's a war going on. Do you know truth in those kinds of ways will affect everything? Like um, I, I really think, which I mentioned already, but I think about prayer. How often do you sit down where you're like, um, is, is, is prayer play? Playing with God because you know he's good for it? Or do, does it get really serious where it's like we're gathered here for warfare? You know, and you're like, you're almost going into it with like, like um, you can hear the Twilight Zone music in the background, like, we're about to do this serious thing. And God's just sitting there going, oh, my kids are here to talk to me. Um, what do you want me to release from heaven? I think prayer is supposed to be play, even the warfare part. <laughs> Amen? I think, what did they do? Um, in war, the worshipers were sent first. Why? Worship is one of the greatest forms of play. <laughs> it was going to be like children that they were going to win war by singing songs <laughs> in praise to, to God, Yeshua. They were going to, they were going to win war. They were going to be victorious in battle through play. <clears throat> Okay, I'm going to hit you with one more. We'll do our um, final scripture and, and talk about this table. Do you know on the night that he was betrayed, he planned a party? That's what the Word of God says. <laughs> on the night he was betrayed, he planned a final party. 
to have with his closest ones. And we're still invited to have the party in remembrance of him as often as we want. In other words, God is saying, party, party, par- how are you going to win this war? You're going to party? <laughs> That's why I have the smiling Jesus up here. How do you usually picture his face? What is the countenance of Jesus' face? Now, he wept too. Look, the word of God is clear. He didn't always have that as the countenance of his face. He wept over sad things. <laughs> he grieved. He got mad at the religious people who basically preached messages the opposite of the one I'm doing this morning. He got really angry at them, and I'm sure his face didn't look like that in those moments. <laughs> Um, But most of the time, I think he knew um, the kingdom of God was not in danger. You know, I didn't say this. The second thing they said was, um, and do you know that he's not worried about whether you succeed in your assignments or not? You can feel everybody in the room take a deep breath. (laughs) You mean it's not dependent on me? The success of the kingdom of God? (laughs) But we think it is sometimes, don't we? Um, My family, like you're powerful enough. To make, <laughs> to make sure your family, <laughs> that everything succeeds with them. Um, that'd be idolatry, isn't it? That'd be, that's like taking up the seat of God. Are you God? You're not responsible for, for the ultimate fate of your family? So some of the things we're going to do during this series, and now I'm going to go in. This is getting ready for the final scripture, the final passage I want to look at. Um, We've done this before here, but we're going to ask God for the miracle of being able to look at stories that you very well know, stories of Jesus and maybe even some Old Testament ones, um, with fresh eyes, like a child with a curiosity and a wonder, trusting that God might actually be want to show you something that you've never seen before or in a totally different way than you've ever read that story before. Now, here's your mission if you choose to accept. Today, and probably through this series, we're going to read these stories, and we're only going to do one thing. We're going to look for the playfulness of God. Does that sound good? Okay. So um, turn to Mark 14, and while you're turning there, we're going to start in verse uh, 22, and y'all know this story very well. This is Jesus walking on the water, okay? I want to tell you, if we backed up into Scripture, which we're not going to do, but just go to like the sequence of what happened right before this, there are really two things right before. One is um, John the Baptist has been executed. In other words, here's what we got to tell you. This is the context of the story we're reading. In other words, Jesus, that, that's his cousin, right? They were probably childhood buddies. They played a lot. And they, they probably talked to God together. They probably prayed together. They, they dreamed things together about what would come like we do um, when we have healthy moments in childhood. May I should say, like we're supposed to do and some of us do. Okay, Um, that would be with John the Baptist, and he was just executed. So in other words, this is a time of deep grieving for Jesus. It's fresh. I mean, things aren't going wonderfully in the context for Jesus. He's very relatable. He has grief. He just lost a loved one, and he is in a season of grieving, loss. The next thing we know that comes just next before and before what we're about to read is that um, the, the ministry is now vibrant. In fact, what the Word of God records is what Jesus just told the disciples before he sends them out on the sea. Um, the sequence before is that he says, go rest. And it actually records that they're so busy with ministry that um, he, it's, it literally states that they didn't have time to eat. That's how busy they are. It's okay, you can have seasons like that, right? But in other words, it's also a season of of extreme industriousness. They are working to the point that Jesus says, okay, I know what you guys need. You really need rest. You need to go off, um, find a place away from everybody where you can rest, you can eat, that kind of thing. That's the context, those two things. Hard work, grieving, 
And Jesus recognizing that what his disciples really need right now is rest. That's how we enter into what we're reading here. And so I'm starting in verse 22. It says, Immediately Jesus made his disciples get into the boat and go before him to the other side, while he sent the multitudes away. And when he had sent the multitudes away, he went up on the mountain by himself to pray. Now, I'm not going to linger here too much, but it would be amiss not to stop and go, you see Jesus um, following the advice he's given, giving to, the, to his disciples, right? He's going to refresh. Where is the place of safety that restores adventure and play and joy in the things that we do? But the safest place on earth is your father, right? So he goes off to be by himself to be with his father. That's recorded here. Now, when evening came... He was alone there, but the boat was now in the middle of the sea, tossed by the waves, for the wind was contrary. So now you know the story. These disciples are out in the middle of the sea, and they're battling a storm. Anybody have a storm or multiple storms going on in your life right now? Couple people? Okay. So you're the ones who can relate to this story then, those of you... (laughs) Verse 25, now in the fourth watch of the night, Jesus went to them walking on the sea. Now I'm just going (laughs) to, seriously, just stop for a minute. Have you ever done this before? What what is he doing? Is this playful? Is he being playful? Have you ever thought of it that way before? I'm going to propose, how could he not be playing? I mean, give me a break. He's, he's walking across the sea. And I can sort of picture this if it was like glassy water, like you can kind of see Jesus walking on the water. But this is in a storm. It's not even flat. It's like waves and stuff like that. And he's walking on the sea. What, what do you think his face looked like? Really serious and austere? <laughs> I, bet, I bet it was kind of like that. Especially knowing kind of what he had planned up. Like, like <laughs> so he's walking out to the boat and he's got to be, let's put this in reality, he's got to be imagining I'm about to get in contact with the boys. That's got to be a fun thought. Come on, seriously, think about it. <clears throat> and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to prove it. There, this is wrought with playfulness. And I'm going to show you. So, and when the disciples saw him walking on the sea, they were troubled, saying, it is a ghost, and they cried out for fear. Now, I don't know about you, but my least favorite joke in the world is like um, when somebody like hides in the dark room, and when you come in, they scare you. I never think that's funny. I'm like, you're lucky I didn't take you out. Like that, telling my son, that is not funny. That is never going to be funny. I have no sense of humor over it, being, being scared like that. But seriously, in this moment, okay, now do this with me. Jesus is walking on the sea. They think he's a ghost, and, and there's some fear going on. They're going, whoa, what's going on here? They're freaking out. And how's Jesus feeling? I mean, what's Jesus doing? Is he being playful? You have to make up your own mind. In fact, keep your finger there because we're going to go back and continue the narrative. But I want you to go to Mark chapter 6, different gospel, same story, and verse 48. And starts exactly the same. Then he saw them straining at rowing for the wind was against them. First of all, just notice the storm didn't stop. Do you notice that? The storm is still raging. And why do I take time to point that out? Do you know, you've got things that are raging. You've got things out of control. You've got storms in your life. But might it be that God is actually inviting you to play with him in the storm, in the midst of while these things are going on in your life? There's a smile on his face, and he's inviting you to play with him. Because might it be that play is one of the most powerful ways for him to get you back into intimacy with him and so that you can actually walk out the storm. (coughs) 
They're straining from rowing for the winds against them now. <clears throat> now about the fourth watch of the night, he came to them walking on the sea and would have passed them by. That has got to be the most peculiar line. Okay, like, are you kidding me? He's walking across the sea, and they're fighting in the storm. They're probably thinking thoughts like, we're dead for sure now. I don't know we're going to get out of this storm. They're struggling at rowing in this circumstance of their life. And here comes Jesus, <laughs> cruising on the stormy waves, and the word of God literally says, and would have passed them by. You can't make that up. What was he going to do? Just, I mean, seriously, picture this story. Picture it for real. Go ahead. Use your imagination. What is he going to do? Just keep walking by? <laughs> it says that he was, it says, and would have passed them by. In other words, you know, I think there's something so powerful here. I think God's inviting us to play and, um, he will pass us by. There is a response in relationship. <laughs> would have passed them by. How would that have worked out? Would he, he have kept going all the way to the other side or come up with another way to mess with them? goes on verse 49, and when they saw him walking on the sea, they supposed it was a ghost and cried out, for they all saw him and were troubled. But he, immediately he talked with, and, talked with them and said to them, be of good cheer, it is I, do not be afraid. Can I suggest he's fooling around? I mean, whatever would they have to be afraid of? It's ridiculous to say be of good cheer, do not be afraid. <laughs> they're about to drown in a storm. They can't beat the wind with their paddles. And now um, a ghost is coming by. They're not sure that it's him walking on the water. That doesn't happen every day. Um, that'd be a little terrifying. And then what he has to say is, be of good cheer. <laughs> don't, don't be afraid. Oh, thanks for that. That's really helpful. I think it's the same way we, we play. Y'all have friends in the room. You know how you play with each other. Now look, the whole time I'm doing this, I'm not minimizing that Jesus is doing serious things. In fact, I'm suggesting exactly the opposite. I'm suggesting that play is a serious thing for him, that it is one of the most powerful tools in his hand to engage you intimately in relationship so that you can grow and become less grumpy and boring than you are right now. <laughs> powerful in God's hand. It's serious, but might it be that his playfulness is the most serious thing that he does with you? Okay, now, now I'm jumping back to Matthew, and in Matthew it says, but immediately Jesus spoke to them saying, be of good cheer, it is I, do not be afraid. Verse 28, and Peter answered him and said, Lord, if it's you, command me to come to you on the water. So Jesus said, come. What do you think his face looks like when Jesus says, come? Have you ever pictured his face in that moment before? There's no way he looks all serious in this moment. He's got to look something like that. In fact, don't you think he's got to be giggling? I know I'm doing my own interpretation. It's not recorded in the Bible that he was giggling. But um, what kind of graven, what kind of dead image do we have of God? He's got to think this is hilarious <laughs> when he invites Peter to play. Will you just observe with me that in this moment they are not ministering to anyone? I think it's an extension of the paragraph right before this chapter where Jesus is telling them, go find a place to rest because they were working so hard they didn't even have time to eat. And now Jesus, as the one who loves them, the lover of their souls, I'm just going to suggest in his prayer with his father, he is coming up with, what do they need? Lord, I pray for them. They need refreshment. If we're going to continue in this crazy life with storms and we're going to continue in this ministry with all of its 
challenges, then they really need refreshment. They really need to have a wild time of play where, where we laugh until it hurts. Um, crazy things that re-spark the adventure and the imagination. Am I stretching it here? Am I teaching crazy things? Or are you with me? <laughs> so he says to Peter, come. And when Peter had come out of the boat, he walked on the water to go to Jesus. Have you ever paused to just imagine <laughs> that moment? Peter's walking on the water with Jesus. I mean, what was that like? Was, do you picture him? What, is, is he at first like, <laughs> do you know what I mean? And then he's like, no, it works. It works. Are they laughing? Yeah, I don't know. It's not totally recorded, but we might as well. Um, Jesus is a real man, the, the lover of your soul. So let's keep him real. I know he's not standing there like this, like, I wonder if Peter's going to be able to pull off this serious operation. That is not what's going on here. There's no way. <laughs> and it goes on and says, but, but when he saw that the wind was boisterous, he was afraid and beginning to sink. This is Peter. He cried out saying, Lord, save me. <clears throat> and you know, we all, we've all heard the sermon on this. I'm sure I've taught it probably more than once. Um, to where the whole idea is you put your eyes on the storm, you put your eyes on the crazy, crazy hard stuff, and you're going to sink. You keep your eyes on Jesus, and, and you stay above the storm. You stay on top of the water. That's, that's always how we teach it, right? And I don't want to minimize that. I think that that's true. That is a serious thing that Jesus is doing here. But on the other hand, um, it was pretty probable <laughs> that, don't, don't forget, the storm's still going. Peter was going to sink, wasn't he? I don't think it surprised Jesus when, like, it was working out for a minute. And I think Jesus is standing there going, hang on a minute. <laughs> and immediately Jesus stretched out his hand and caught him and said to him, Oh, you of little faith, why did you doubt? And when they got into the boat, the wind ceased. Now let's slow down here for a minute. Peter is the one who had enough faith... <laughs> in God, in Jesus, to be the one to accept the invitation to come and play. He got out of the boat, and he's the one walking to Jesus, begins to sink. Jesus grabs him and says, Oh, you of little faith, why did you doubt? What about the rest of them? I'm just going to propose that he was joking. I'm serious. I kind of had my eyes open to this as I, as I sat with this in prayer this week, that um, how could he possibly be really serious in terms of wanting to convict Peter of having little faith? I mean, why would he have little faith in this circumstance? There's a storm raging. For the first time in his life, he's walking on the surface of waves <laughs> with a wind and now he's sinking and Jesus grabs him how could he possibly be entirely serious when he says to Peter oh you of little faith why did you doubt well I mean there was nothing to have doubt in in these circumstances do you know God is part of play is great story am I right it's a huge part of play, telling great stories. I just want to put this out there. How many times do you think these guys recounted this story? And how deep do you think their belly laugh was when they got to the part when Peter falls in and Jesus calls him little faith? It had to be. <laughs> I bet they never stopped laughing. I bet they're still laughing their way through this story. Finding the joy in the story. Remembering that they felt, felt closest to him in these wild moments of play. Where just a second ago, I thought we were going to die. I thought that storm was going to eat us. Yeah, you remember that? Oh, do I remember that? And here comes Jesus. Can you hear him telling the story? You remember what he looked like? He had that big grin on his face like nothing was wrong. The playfulness of God. 
And then the last verse I'll read is verse 33. Then those who were in the boat came and, actually, I, I'm skipping something that I can't skip. Do you want to see the humor of God? Verse 32. And when they got into the boat, the wind ceased. You have got to be kidding me. <laughs> it might have been better, um, unless we want to interpret this too seriously, it might have been better to have Peter walk on the water for, for his first time with smooth water. <laughs> except for the wild playfulness of God. I think, that, I think they laughed about that. Got in the boat and... <laughs> it gets nice and still. I don't care who you are, that's a sense of humor. That's a great story that glorifies God and draws people into friendship with him. Who's your God? Tell me about him again. <laughs> that's a crazy God that you know I know you should hear the other stories I got you follow me I mean actually I put this out there could it be that he is authoring storms in your life because he can't wait for that time when you actually respond to his invitation to play <clears throat> could it be and you see the majesty of God because he's wild enough to allow a storm in your life so that when you actually accept his invitation to come out and play with him it's going to be a wild time of play and laughter because of the storm might it be that he's far more playful than you think he is how many ways could he have done this story? Did it need to be exactly this one? I'm going to suggest to you, this is a playbook. <laughs> it's a book of play. Where he is, he is so delighted with his people that he's planned adventures, adventures infinite. I'm going to do this with you and I'm going to have this crazy time with you. <laughs> you follow me? There's a place in the Bible, I don't know where it is right now, where it says if, uh, um, if all the things of Jesus were recorded in this book, there wouldn't be enough, something to the effect, there wouldn't be enough libraries in all the universe to hold it. Those are your stories of play and I think he's always inviting he's always good not just in the good times okay listen to me we've got to get this the safety to play is not in your circumstances and it never will be the safety to, to come out and play because we all get to play, the safety does not come from your circumstances. Peter did not get the safety to play from the storm, from the circumstances. You follow me? Where's the safety to play? From the Father. I'm a child of God. I know the end of the story. I know he delights in me. I know he doesn't care. He, he doesn't even care when I have bad behavior. It doesn't scare him. He still looks like that. <laughs> because he delights in me. He is always inviting me to play. The safety to come out and play is from a good, good father. He's inviting you to play in the storm. To see his majesty. To find the place of your deepest belly laugh. <laughs> because God makes me laugh. Amen? <clears throat> okay. Just make sure I don't have anything else to say. I'm out of scripture? Well, we're done then. <laughs> Liz said we're complete, we've used all, <laughs> we're completely out of scripture. So we're going to go to the Lord's table. You know this too? 
this too was play? On the night he was betrayed, he delighted. The word, the scriptures use the word delight, and now I'm paraphrasing in um, the Gospel of Paul. Um, he delighted in throwing a dinner party for his closest ones. He delighted in announcing a, the new covenant of his blood over supper. That in the spilling of my blood, in the crucifixion of me, you're invited to play with me for eternity. Infinite belly laughs, infinite risks that we're going to take together. Adventures <laughs> that we're going to have together because you know what? You're in. You have a seat at my table. Even as the world betrays him and the, and the world does not believe in him and the world is trying to shut him down, we'll never stop trying to shut down the kingdom of God, but the kingdom's not in danger. Even in the midst of his betrayal, you have a seat at the table. You are invited to the party. Amen. And in his broken body is the healing <clears throat> is the healing of our bodies, is our wholeness is found in his brokenness, in the broken bread. <laughs> You're going to run out of amens. <laughs> no, I'm not, he says. <laughs> I dare you. <laughs> Try and make me. <clears throat> you have a seat at Jesus' table. And... Um, and it is an invitation to play. And so um, today, um, here's the thing. Um, in just a moment, I'm going to have um, some folks, um, whoever wants, help me administer, get this, get this out in your hands. <clears throat> the gifts of God that he wants to put in your hands. And I want to do something. We're going to do a relinquishing exercise for all who want to go. Um, do you know um, the last thing your enemy and God's enemy wants is, uh, is for you to feel invited to come out and play with Jesus. So the enemy is always trying to provide lies for you and a focus on your circumstances, like when Peter started to sink, which at least for a second there, it started to ruin Peter's play. You know that it did. <laughs> He is always trying to create and give you things that get in the way of being absolutely free to play with God. Do you know there's no circumstance worth giving up God's invitation to come out and play? No grief, no calamity, no struggle is actually powerful enough to force you. You have to choose to give up your playfulness with Jesus. That's a choice. And so we're going to do a relinquishing thing over the Lord's table because I believe sometimes the way to get back to that freedom where we belly laugh with Jesus, where we do risky things in play and see how, how far apart we can set apart the leap just for the fun of it with Jesus and those kinds of things, to get back to that, we have to relinquish something. We have to let go of something that's in the way of our play. Something that's in the way of the safe feeling we have with the Father that says, I get to play too. Do you all resonate with that? Okay, if I could get um, five, five um, men, women, people, come on up, some, anyone that's willing to help, and we'll get this distributed. We do need one of you to distribute out into the fellowship hall, and we'll pray over the meal when you guys are finished distributing. Thank you, guys. Just hold on to it when you get it. <clears throat> We're going to do this together. We're going to play together. You know, that's the other one I didn't talk about. You know what's essential to play? Not that it's impossible to play alone, but I think the only reason we can play alone is because we're never alone. <laughs> it is the breath of life. It is the breath of God in us that makes it some of my best plays when I, I think I'm alone, but I'm not alone. It's really the communion with God in that play. But play is relational, period. It's impossible to feel entirely lonely and play. That's another thing that research shows.
Okay, I invite you to take a posture of receptivity. Whatever helps you become aware of the presence of God that is already in you and before you and behind you and all around you. The presence of safety. It says, it's okay, you can come out and play, it's safe. Take some deep breaths. And our prayer begins with, come Holy Spirit into my awareness. Make me fully aware of you. I don't want to miss any of you, God. Thank you, Jesus. And then to begin this exercise, I'm going to give you a moment to sit in the Holy Spirit with this question. Holy Spirit, what is it that most gets in my way of feeling free to come out and play with you, to accept your invitation to play? Holy Spirit, what do you need me to relinquish and trust you with so that I'm free to play? Okay, y'all got something? Give me a nod if you got something. Oh, praise God. Okay. All right, now we're going to go through a couple of steps, and I'm just going to lead you all the way in relinquishing something, okay? And the first thing is, just take a moment to admit to God what you fear most. What is the fear in it? What do you fear most in what might happen? Take a moment <clears throat> to just take the whole situation and place it in God's hands. You might even have a picture of doing that. Okay, now this next step <clears throat> will require trust. And before I give you the step, I want to let you off the hook. You might have, with this particular thing, a little tiny seed of trust <laughs> or you may have a whole bunch and if all you've got is a little tiny seed of trust he says it is enough use that the next thing is tell him that you will accept whatever he allows to happen and finally acknowledge that his plans are always better than yours. <laughs> and that's relinquishing something. Now you're free to play. At least that barrier, <laughs> at least that hindrance. And so far as you continue to trust, even if it was just that tiny seed of trust was all you had to offer him in that, you're freer to play. You can trust and let that go. And so now we're going to accept his invitation to play. <laughs> On the night he's, he was betrayed, he said to his disciples, we're going to play. And he took bread and he broke it and said, in my brokenness is your wholeness. And we, we accept the wholeness, even the wholeness that comes in relinquishing like we just did. And his invitation to you now is take the bread and consume him fully and accept the invitation to play.
During the same party, he took up the cup. And he said, this is the new covenant of my blood. This is your irrevocable invitation to be a part of my party for all of eternity. And so what I want to do today, I want to play a little bit. I want to make a toast to Jesus as we do in, at parties. And so all together now, will you raise your cup? And we say, we toast you, Jesus. We thank you for your grace. We thank you that your invitation to us is to play with you forever. Play that is full of belly laughs and risk-taking and unknown destinations <laughs> and all the intimate relationship that comes with it, playing with you. We toast to you, Jesus. And if you agree, just say, here's to Jesus. <laughs> and we take the cup. And finally, as we dismiss, Lord, I want to offer a prayer for each one here. In the authority of your name, Jesus, I seal the work. <clears throat> Any word that you've spoken this morning in someone's heart, the most powerful thing in the universe, your, your word, any word that you've spoken, I ask, Lord, that it would find rich soil, that it would be protected from the evil one, that it would be untouchable and will not be stolen in the name of Jesus. And, Lord, I, I just ask that you will lighten their awareness in the days ahead, in this beautiful weather that you're blessing us with. And uh, as they step out of this place, in the days of the head. Will you just enlighten our awareness to all of your, your thousands, your millions of invitations to play with you, to have fun, accept your invitation to laugh, your invitation to take a risk and trust you with it, all the fun and the joy of seeing the fruit of, of playful risk-taking, and that we will become more and more aware of your playfulness. Thank you for calling us friends. I thank you that when, when I was young, I struggled over um, just being invited by anyone to play. A lot of rejection. <laughs> and Lord, I know that there is never rejection with you. And I just want to thank you that you've called us friends. You've decided that we're the ones that you delight in and you just want to play with us. And that blesses me. And so, Lord, I, I ask that that blessing, the awareness of that blessing, would, would just come to them again and again and again in their days, even while they're in the middle of the hard thing or the storm. That they would hear your voice saying, come on, play with me. We love you, Jesus. Amen.